Welcome to episode 114 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent James Furry, who served in the FBI for 31 years, 11 as a professional support employee, and 20 as a special agent. In this episode, Jim Furry reviews his Church of Love case. Donald Lowry and Pamela St. Charles were charged with 26 counts of mail fraud for operating the Church of Love, a romance scam perpetrated against 31,000 lonely heart male victims who were defrauded of $4.5 million in losses discovered during the four-year investigation. During his FBI support career, James Furry was assigned to a special support group conducting surveillances on hostile Russian intelligence agents while serving in New Orleans and the Washington field office. During his agent career, most of his time was in the Newark division, working organized crime and supervising an organized crime squad, a crimes against children squad, and serving as the World Trade Center command post supervisor. He was also a hostage negotiator, a police instructor, and taught foreign police schools in Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and the Ukraine. After his retirement from the FBI, Furry worked as an anti-money laundering consultant. He is the author of Fidelity, Bravery, and Integrity, My Story, The True Life and Career of an FBI Special Agent, a memoir about his FBI career that includes a chapter on the Church of Love. To learn more about Jim, you can visit his website, Jim Furry, that's F U R R Y dot com. But before we get to the interview, I want to let you know that I sent my May email to my reader team. It features a review I wrote of former director Jim Comey's book. Don't worry, it's nonpartisan because, as you know, we don't do politics here. I also keep you up to date on several new TV shows, and movies that feature the FBI. Plus, there's a digest of the previous month's podcast episodes and my crime fiction recommendation. To be able to get that newsletter, all you need to do is join my reader team at jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop-up. When you join my reader team, you also get the FBI Reading Resource, which is a list of books about the FBI written by written by some of the FBI agents who have appeared on this podcast. Jim Furry's book is there, as well as my book, Pay to Play. I don't do Patreon, nor do I have ads on this podcast, but if you want to support the show, in addition to joining my reader team, and subscribing to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast app, you can pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or someone you know who loves crime fiction. Thank you. Now here's the show. I'm excited to introduce my guest, Jim Furry. Hey, Jim, how are you? Good. How are you doing this morning, Jerry? I'm doing good. So your new book, Fidelity, Bravery, and Integrity, My Story, The True Life and Career of an FBI Special Agent, was just released and is packed with cases and stories about your career in the FBI. And today, we're going to talk about what I think has to be one of the most unique fraud cases Yes, uh, it's also unique for a lot of reasons, but it uh, has all the elements of things that, that people just sit back and uh, get that wow factor. They say, really? People, this really happened? So, yeah, it, it has a lot of aspects to it that uh, really make it an interesting case, I think. 
So where do you want to start? I can, uh, it's very easy. I, I can, uh, I was working as a first office agent out in the Rock Island Resident Agency, which was a, it's a small office, a satellite office for the Springfield, Illinois division. The office there had had a few complaints about uh, pornography, and the agent there at the time had gone over to this company. It was called Lydian Manor Printers, and an individual who ran that company was a person named Donald Lowry. But he had taken a look at the pictures, and they were no worse than anything you would find in Playboy or Penthouse. So he really kind of uh, sidestepped it for a while. But then uh, the Moline Police Department got some uh, letters and some uh, information, and they connected with the uh, postal authorities, the Postal Inspection Service, who uh, contacted us again, and the uh, senior resident agent in Rock Island said, here, Jim, take a look at this, see see if you think there's something there. Well, it turns out the information from the Moline Police Department was from an attorney whose father it was elderly, and, and uh, the uh, attorney looked at the father's banking account and saw all these checks going to COL International. And uh, he wondered what that was all about, so he asked his father, and his father was very secretive about it, and it smelled of uh, mail fraud to, to this attorney. So he wrote up a nice referral and sent it to the Moline Police Department. And from that point... Uh, we got together the IRS and the FBI and the postal inspectors and, and Moline Police Department and uh, decided to do a, a task force and take a look to see what possibly could be uh, criminally liable in the whole thing. So the postal inspector brought to the table that they had had complaints too as well. So we went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in, in Peoria and we uh, – talked with a AUSA by the name of Tate Chambers. And when he took a look at it, he actually had to do a, a, a real sales job on his boss there, the U.S. Attorney of, of the uh, Middle District of Illinois, because uh, they were looking at it and they, they were just saying, that, oh, you know, it's a, a charity, but the problem is going to be getting getting these elderly men to accept the fact that they were victims, that they were giving this money willingly who are you going to get to testify? Well, um, AUSA Chambers uh, did a real good job and, and got some uh, grand jury subpoenas for us, and we served a uh, federal grand jury subpoena on the business, asking for records of all their uh, of all their business activity. And as a result of that, uh, we branched out and, and did a major investigation, two year investigation. And uh, we actually did develop a major mail fraud case and were able to get convictions in the end. But going from here to there was quite a, an interesting journey as well, the two-year the two, uh, span that we did the investigation. What were the initial complaints? You, you talked about pictures of gantily clad women. Was that part of the scam? Absolutely. That was kind of they, – they did a newsletter – Originally, it was supposed to be uh, some kind of a, a club where they explained that, that there were these fallen girls, these girls that had been prostitutes or had been addicted to drugs, and they actually used the image of Donald Lowry's wife, Esther. Uh, she was uh, an immigrant from uh, Mexico, and they called her Mother Maria. Her name was Maria Esther Lowry, and uh, so... She, they called her Mother Maria, and she was supposed to have a compound where she would take these girls in and, you know, get them to do, you know, rehabilitation, to get them back involved in the mainstream of society. But actually what, what happened was they, they went to the University of Iowa and they took uh, prostitutes off the street and they... They told them that they were going to take their pictures for a private collector. Well, the private collector turned out to be somewhere around, you know, over 30,000 elderly men who were who was getting these solicitations. So they would they would build storylines on all these young ladies that they called 
love angels. And the call, or the church of love is what we called it, was was sending lulling letters out to these these elderly men. So, for example, you're you're a, a widower and you're at home and you don't have a lot of friends, and you get a letter in the mail from this young lady who's maybe topless, and she's saying, you know, I'd like to be your pen pal. Basically, uh, I'm living I'm living with Mother Maria, and uh, I'm trying to be, get back into society. So it appeal, appeals to the uh, the elderly gentleman's, uh, uh, you know, he he's saying to himself, "Oh, I'd like to help these girls," thinking that they're really there. And so you join the club for a, a minimal amount. I don't know, it was fifteen or twenty-five dollars. Then you start getting these letters from various angels with different names, and then one of them becomes your love angel, and and then. Whoever the ghostwriter was at the at the uh, Lydia Manor Printers would would send letters out to these guys, telling them about different promotions and campaigns and how you can be better, you know, uh, how you can be a better person, how you can live a fuller life, and uh, you know, my name is Angel Debbie, and things would happen. For instance, they would say, "I like to make a a nice present for Mother Maria for her birthday. Her birthday is coming up." All the angels are getting a nice present for her. Could you send me some money so I could buy Mother Maria a present? Well, this was this letter was going out to thousands of people, so thousands of elderly gentlemen. So uh, the next thing you knew, these checks were coming in to the Church of Love or see it Call International. They would put it sometimes in the memos of the section of the checks that they were write, you know, for Angel Debbie's uh, present to Mother Maria. Now, the funny thing was sometimes they would say something like there was a promotion that said Mother Maria wants to train the girls on on sewing machines so that they can make clothes and they can uh, design clothes and that kind of thing. So could you please send the donation so we could buy sewing machines for for the for your love angel? Well, some of these guys were so enthusiastic about it, they would actually go – to a store and buy a sewing, uh, like a Singer sewing mach- tabletop sewing machine, and they would send it to send it to the uh, address in Hillsdale, Illinois, which is just outside of, of Moline. I guess that's not what Don Lowry wanted. He wanted cash. He didn't want a sewing machine. <laughs> no, no. But what actually would happen was when they'd have street sales. When the when Moline would have the stores would have street sales and. Uh, what he would do is gather a lot of that stuff that was sent in, jewelry and, uh, you know, sewing machines and whatever they were sending these girls. He would stick it out on the street and sell it. <laughs> so, so what What was his legitimate business? So I, it sounds like he does have a store or some type of business that he was operating. What was that? Yes, it was called Lydian Manor uh, Printers. And... Uh, he he would do printing services much like uh oh like Office Max or FedEx or he he'd do printing services signs actually he did work for the Moline Police Department when they would have a a fundraiser or an event he would print out stuff for them or he I don't think he was making all that much on the on the printing that he was doing but but he was pulling in I guess the four years that we looked at him, it was, he was pulling in a million dollars a year over those four year, over that four year period. So, the bulk of his profits were coming through uh, through the Church of Love. So, now you're you're talking about this printing service. This was during this was during the the 1980s before computers. So these photos and this communications were all being made through the mail, and that's why you were paired up or partnered up with a postal inspector. Yes, yes. At the mailings, actually, because they, the the uh, ladies never existed, and they were mailing these these little folders with the with the uh, with the angel and her background and what she was currently doing. They were mailing them out, and every mailing constituted a, a count of mail fraud. So we literally could have had thousands of, of uh, counts of mail fraud at five years apiece, possible uh, 
j- uh, prison sentence. But uh, but of course you have when you go to trial you have to prove every every count of mail fraud. So we would we picked out what we thought were the 19 best mail fraud counts, mail fraud violations we could find that involved some of the uh, people that we thought were the best victims, including we we included some of the angels who had never uh, realized that their that their uh, uh, mailings were going all over the country. They thought it was for a private collector, so they were victims, as well as th- these elderly men, some of which we had to convince to be victims <laughs> um, because they were so involved in thinking that, that they would uh, actually, as you got further down in the fraud, they would t- promise these guys that someday they called it a, a paradise uh, called Sean Zah, and they said this compound will be opened in this paradise type village where they could go and visit their love angels. So that was that, kind of that, a that sounds very similar to Shangri La. Right. Is that on right. purpose? Yeah, I think he used I think he used that as a basis and made up the name Sean to, to give these to give these guys a, a basically a fantasy that as a matter of fact that's what he used a lot as his defense that when we went to trial that uh, that all these men knew that they'd never really get to come meet their the their love angels they would they were sending this this money just to help out because they were getting paid they were getting these pictures and stuff and and it was all just a big fantasy of course that wasn't true all these guys just about everyone we we talked to intended someday if they didn't die first to to go to uh, Sean Dazaw and meet their love angel, you know. That's another thing. They used a post office box in Hillsdale, Illinois, which is a little town north of Moline. And uh it's just another side light. Uh we talked with the postmaster up there and and uh she she told us that uh over the years she would have people walk in and and asking her, where can I find Shonda Zaw? <laughs> she was like clueless, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so some of these guys on their own, after they've been contributing money, they said, well, it's a post office box, Hillsdale, Illinois. I'm just going to go ha- go uh, pay them a visit. <laughs> and they would show up at Hillsdale Post Office asking, where, where's the, uh, where's the Church of Love? Where's, where's the Shonda Zaw? <laughs> and, uh, and the and the uh, postmaster there was just she was just befuddled like I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> and they would turn around and go home. I was reading some of the newspaper articles about this case, which I will put a link to in the episode show notes at jerrywilliams dot com. But one of them says that Lowry's defense was that his whole scam, this Church of Love scam was based on the principle that for these guys, the illusion of romance was better than having no romance at all. So in a way, he really wanted people to believe that he was performing some type of social service by stringing them along and making them think that you know there was a beautiful woman who was in love with them. Sure, but that also made a very good, uh, uh, it made a hard-hitting impact on the jury when when we got some of those guys up there that had actually sent jewelry or had sent a sewing machine or sent something, and uh, AUSA Chambers, when he was questioning them, and said, "Now, did you did you intend to send that sewing machine to a fantasy?" <laughs> and this, and you could see it in the in the faces of the jurors; they're just rolling their eyes, going, "You know, either one, he really believed there was a uh, love angel there that was receiving that." sewing machine or or he just uh just one of the dumbest people in the world one of the two so uh the jury impact for for the uh victims that we found that actually sent uh things to their love angels was uh was pretty pretty immediate and pretty uh convincing i think you had mentioned that there were thousands of victims how many exactly actually the irs did did most of the uh uh, financial analysis, which was a blessing, but I think they had about thirty-three thousand, is is what the count was, across the United States. And we even had one gentleman in Texas who had changed his will, and he was going to will upon his death, he was going to will his entire estate 
to uh, Donald. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty. That's another convincing thing that he thought the place was was real. And how much money are we talking about? I mean, with all these victims, even though some of them may have been sending in less than a hundred dollars. Over the number of years and with the number of victims, 33,000 victims, what type of uh, financial loss are we, what type of financial fraud are we talking about? Well, it was, it was a million dollars a year for the year, the years that we uh, investigated and it came into over four million dollars. Uh, so we went back two years, the investigation took two years and it was uh, somewhere around a million dollars a year which is pretty amazing. Uh, we had an informant that actually told us that uh, the, he, he really felt he was one of the ghost writers. That, he was my informant, and he became a cooperating witness. And he, he actually told the story that uh, the one member that he had, that he was soliciting money from was was walking up and down the, the highway picking up cans and, and turning them in for a nickel deposit and saving up that money to send to the church of love. So the guy was almost in, indigent and he was he was going on this uh, mission because he he felt like he should uh, uh make money to give to give to the church of love. Really really kind of sad if you think about it. Absolutely. So did you ever have an opportunity to talk to Donald Lowry or did he testify at the trial? Oh Where sure. Where did he come up with this concept of the Church of Love? Well, I think it was uh, uh, Call C O L was kind of like a valley between uh, between mountains, I think, and and I think he uh, he sold it like you said before. He sold it as a self help, and one of his little pamphlets that he sent out was a self help pamphlet. It's called "Don't Let the Bastards Get You Down," and so he interwove the. He really pulled to the heartstrings of these elderly men be, because you know he was they were trying to help these girls and and it was really i I don't know where he formulated the whole the whole plan, but it it came together and I think well like i said i don't know he's uh he's a complicated he was a very intelligent fellow and uh he was a very good he liked to say that he was a wordsmith, so he was a very good writer, and that that was apparent in some of the letters that he authored, or some of the uh, letters that he. Uh, so I think he thought of himself as kind of a Hugh Hefner writer combination kind of stuff, and and I think the more he got into it, he probably developed these storylines and found out how much money he was making, and nobody was calling him to task. So I think I think he just developed the whole thing out of his mind. So I think that's where it came from. So he started off as, it sounds like, just uh, doing like an, an advice column for the lovelorn, for sad, lonely men. And then once he realized that they were so desperate that he could get money from him, it turned into a scam. Or, or had he had other cons and other scams before this? Uh, I'm trying to think. if I don't remember if he had a, a criminal record before. I honestly don't re- recall that. It's been a while, but uh, I think this is this was his this was his major uh, thrust here, and and as soon as he found out the kind of money that was that was out there, we we often talked when we were doing the investigation. Had he have, had he put in his literature, you know, your this is all part of your fantasy. He put a disclaimer in there, a one line disclaimer, and he probably was still got tons of donations and stuff, but. It, he could have probably skated on the whole thing because if he would have put a disclaimer in there that understand Sean Dazal never existed and never will exist and the love angels are just photographs, it would have been, you know, but he may not have gotten as much money as he thought he might have. So I, I you know, he was very close to, uh, and I think that's part of the reason why the U.S. attorney in Peoria was was hesitant uh but they were also afraid the victims would be would support him, which a small group of of, of the victims did. They were, you know they they testified, but they testified in behalf of, of uh, Donald Lowry's defense. So it was kind of a it was kind of sitting on the rail uh, kind of trial the 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 month long trial that we had in Peoria because uh, every day you had this group of 
call supporters that would go out to lunch with uh, Donald and his first assistant there was Pamela. Her Actually, her real name was Pamela Ortiz, and she changed it to Pamela St. Charles to make it more Hollywood type. But uh, she was a local girl, and uh, uh, they were they were the two defendants on trial. His wife, Esther, or Mother Maria, uh, the charges were dropped against her because defense counsel uh, uh, petitioned the court that she was a Spanish speaker and that he wanted to have a translator, Spanish translator, in in the trial so that she could understand what was going on. Well, the, the U.S. attorney in Peoria added Hillary Fruman and uh, Darlin Canals, two other assistant U.S. attorneys, to help take chambers because it was going to be such a large case. And we had a conference and decided that for two reasons. Uh, I don't know if you anybody watches that show Bull, where they where they do judging on the potential jurors. But we had we had a, a situation exactly like that because we're looking at the jury, and we're saying this is going to uh, triple the amount of time it's going to take to go go to trial instead of a 30 day trial. It's going to take 90 days. The jurors are just going to get bored to death. Uh, you're going to have a man and his wife and his first assistant sitting there on the defendant table, and everything has to be translated. So we looked at the whole situation, and actually um, the three AUSAs made the decision that if we drop her out, you don't have to deal with the Spanish, and it looks it looks much better to have the older gentleman. Uh, he has a, like he had a mustache, and he and he he had a kind of arrogance to him, and then you had his pretty uh, assistant sitting next to him. And we're thinking, yeah, okay, basically you got a dirty old man and a young woman there at the defense table instead of a man, his wife, and and the assistant. So for jury presentation and for the length of the trial and for the – and we were thinking, what what are we going to get out of sending his wife to prison? So they, they dropped the charges against her to make it a stronger case. I guess it ended up being a good decision. But it certainly was risky because the whole concept of the Church of Love was built on Mother Maria and his wife, Esther, she was Mother Maria. So I I wonder if there were times where the drawers or the defense kind of played up, played up on the fact that there were, you know, was no Mother Maria. That's the the whole focus was, was basically to say it, it was all one big fantasy and, uh, well, they didn't see Mother Maria there, but I think it did come out in trial, if I remember correctly, though. The the pictures, Mother Maria also wrote letters, and the pictures of Mother Maria on the letters were pictures of Donald Lowry's wife. So they had, uh, the jurors would have had to, uh, you know, add two and two to say, oh, but they probably did wonder why she wasn't, she wasn't a defendant there, because that was all pre-trial motion, so they... They never really saw her sitting at the defense counsel table, so I think, yeah, it was it was risky. It was there was there was a chance there, but they, there was also another play that that jumped into the whole thing that right before the between the time where he was indicted and we went to trial, he all, all of a sudden got this idea that he was going to go out and uh, uh, try and convince a bunch of the members <laughs> that that it was all for real. And that they were planning to do all of this, you know, I think he was trying to do that. I don't know whether he did it at the behest of his attorney or whether he came up with the idea himself. But they they had this gathering, and they took they took some of the employees. Uh, actually, and there was one of the ladies that I also ended up turning as a, as a cooperating witness. They took these employees and they dressed them up in gowns and uh, had their hair done beautifully and and uh, they had this convention of of, of call members and i don't know how many they they had a lot of people come and they put this stage show on where these these love angels all of which were employees and none of them were really love angels but they came out dancing on the stage and then there was a there was a big uh you know, like a big entrance scene with uh, trumpets sounding and, and there's a puff of smoke. And out of that comes Esther Lowry as Mother Maria. <laughs> so so we, had, we through the CW, we got a copy of that tape. 
uh, uh, that. Oh, they videotaped it. They videotaped it because I think they planned on sending out the other to other members to convince them that it was all for real, so that they wouldn't come into trial and, and say that they were scammed. And you, we had it all on videotape with Mother Maria, which was Donald Lowry's wife. So that kind of helped out a little bit that they made a pretty dumb move at that time. The difference, you mentioned this before, that the difference between a fraud and, you know, just a, a fantasy is that they take something of value that's based on a lie or a deception. It's really funny that after the fact, now they're, they're trying to create you know, some reality to, to their lie. It's, that's really a, a, a strange way to defend yourself. Yeah, it was a it was a uh, a very interesting. I mean, as we progressed through the investigation, there was always one turn or another. And and uh, I was the first office agent, the 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 informant, the the gentleman that that was a ghostwriter. That interview was uh, he, he was my first CW, and it was. Uh, uh, it was interesting working that that aspect. Uh, another thing during the trial, uh, we got done after after the day's work. And, and Jerry, you know you've been through trials before. You never stop. You go from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. You know, late at night. And we always had to prepare prepare witnesses after we got done with tri- all day long at, after trial. So. Uh, one one night, Tate said, uh, "Here's a here's a guy I'd like to get, but he's down in he retired and he's down in Brazil or Peru or someplace down there." He says, "I want to talk to him. Can you get him on the phone?" I said, "Tate, yeah, I'll try tonight and see what I can do." So I set up a phone call for the next night, but I had to I had to call the um, our league at in a South American country, maybe it was Brazil, I think. But anyway, this poor guy had to get one of the local police officers that he knew, one of the federal officers he knew, and, and let's, we'll use Brazil, and they traveled out in the jungle somewhere. This guy had a little hut in the jungle, and then he, the legat told me I had to put him in a Jeep, and we had to take him 40 miles to get to a telephone so he could call your AUSA. We set up the phone call, and then after Tate talked to him, Tate says, no, you know what, the government's not going to pay to have him fly him out of the jungle clear from Brazil up here for a trial. So so I later got a scathing scathing report from FBI headquarters that I should never never, uh, have our legats do do all that work and then not call a guy for trial. (laughs) But... You know, you learn you learn from these experiences, but uh, we were trying to get the best the best uh, witnesses we could. And then the other thing that that happened while the trial was ongoing was that you had this Pamela St. Charles, who's a stunning blonde. And again, going back to bull and uh, uh, what jurors you keep and what jurors you strike, we kept a young man on that we thought would understand the fraud. And it turned out that he he fell in love with Pamela St. Charles. She st- she sat there, and we could tell she was making eyes, and but there's not much he could do. The judge kind of ignored it or didn't, you know, I don't know whether whether he was in a position to say anything, but he would smile at her and she'd smile back at him and that kind of thing, uh, nonverbal uh, communication. And um, at the end of the trial, we found out... Uh, it was odd, and I, again, I don't want to get the cart before the horse, but it goes with the story that they found uh, uh, Donald Lowry guilty of 19 counts of mail fraud, and they only found Pamela St. Charles guilty of 18 counts. They found her not guilty on one count. So Tate went, went and talked to some of the jurors after that, and uh, they said well, this young man was holding out for uh, for acquittal for both of them. And the only way we could get him to vote guilty on the on the whole thing was if we dropped if if we voted not guilty on one of the counts for Pamela. <laughs> so there again, uh, you were talking about risky business. If you get one one bad juror on a on a jury, it can really uh, tear up your whole case. It also shows how gullible people can be. And this particular case, it's men. 
you know, when they're desperate or when they're lonely or when they're seeking romance. So, so this is basically a chase that happened, you know, many years ago, but it happens all the time now. It's a, a romance fraud. Oh, yeah. I, and you know what I think? I'm sure there are people that uh, that appeal to people's emotions, loneliness, and and um, you may, maybe somebody's lost their wife uh, two or three years prior, and uh, and they're looking for something in their lives. And uh, I I w- I would not be surprised if there are is somebody out there doing something like that right now, using all the uh, the technical advancements, cell phones, and and the internet, and computers, and everything else. A Lonely Hearts Club. You don't hear them very often anymore, but you know, I I actually think it probably is even larger now, because one of the things that the internet does it allows you to access more people from around the world. I mean, because he was using the mail, Donald Lowry was basing his scam here in the U.S. But you know, when you get on the internet. You can take a scam like this, and the only barrier is language, but you can go around the world. So it probably is even more prevalent now, the same basic principle of the illusion of romance. But I would not be surprised, as you said, that if this is continuing at a bigger scale today. Yeah, and especially when you when you hear on the, on the most current news about how how the ISPs don't, I mean, they they look for things like terrorism, and they look for uh, violent acts and uh, active shooters and that kind of thing. How many of them look look for somebody that's reaching out to to lonely people? <laughs> I doubt that's on their high on their list of of uh, things to search for. But but again, that's just my opinion. I'm you know I I haven't been involved in uh, in anything any uh, internet investigations of that nature so I, I i really don't uh know how easy it is it wouldn't surprise me let's put it that way do you remember any of the personal stories of some of the men that were caught up in the scam i know we talk about elderly men i did see in one of the newspaper articles it was a guy that was 31 years old and did he work on a ranch or did he work and uh, auto supply, but he was caught up in this too. So do you have any stories about some of the men involved? Well, I think the the one that jumps to my mind and and it really just uh, amazes me. Uh, and he wasn't he wasn't real elderly. He was a full university of professor of philosophy for University of Illinois. But he was one that was actually uh, defending them. And when they put him on to testify, he talked about all kinds of, a lot of stuff I didn't understand and talked about theory and uh, emotional theory. and and uh, But cross-examination, I think Tate or AUSA Chambers pretty much put him in his place by by saying, well, you know, I forget how much he contributed, but so uh, whatever his name was, so you contributed, and I'm going to use the figure, eighteen thousand dollars over the past four years to to an organization for your fantasy to fulfill your fantasy, <laughs> and and it was like again you looked at the you looked at the jury and they were going oh unbelievable you know it, it was just so outrageous that when he had the the, the figures that these people gave. The one, the one that I told you before, the guy that put in his will that he was going to donate his entire estate to the Church of Love, and and these these guys that would defend him, and in spite of the fact that they knew they were being scammed, they in the in their hearts when it when they when all this came to uh, realization, and they and they were called as a witness to testify how much money they gave to this organization for nothing for a couple of letters of and some pictures of some young girls, it had to have been a, a traumatic experience for them. And then there were a few that we had that, uh, like I think, I think that young man you're referring to, he was he was really angry. You know, he was the kind of guy that you would say, let's, let's hope he doesn't have a gun or, or, you know, when these guys go to lunch because he was very angry. Yeah, the, these, these guys sacrificed 
and they uh, had expectations, and they and they truly believed as a uh, basically a religious experience that they you know this is a it's kind of a combination of of uh, charity and religion and um, you know sexual excitement at the same time you know so some of them were pulled in real real tight but the other the flip side of the victims you haven't asked me but I'm going to bring it up is the is the girls that posed you know we had a registered nurse from from uh, the Georgia area and uh, she was prominent love angel and of course she was years older and she was well established in a hospital and when she came in and we started showing those pictures she blushed she never she said i was you know i did this to make some money in college and i had no idea it was going out all over the united states and and to all these men she her fear was that somebody as she's walking uh down the street someday somebody's going to walk up to her and say you're my love angel, you know. You're 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 love angel Vanessa. We're gonna I'm gonna come be with you forever, you know. That it's it was a scary proposition. Another one, real quick. She had gone to uh, graduate school, and she had gone to a, a high profile. I won't mention the company, but it was a very prominent company, uh, retail company in New York City, and she was an executive in that company. And Tate Chambers said, I want her. I want her as a witness. So I called the company, and uh, I said, is she still employed there? Yeah, yeah, she is. Can I speak to her? Well, no. So what do you want to speak to her about? And I said, well, uh, she's involved in an investigation. I want I want her as a witness. And they switched me immediately to the legal department. The legal department said, is it okay if she does a de- deposition? We'll send you the deposition. I said no, <laughs> and, and uh, they tried. They did not even want her to be interviewed. Uh, they were afraid, I think, of uh, embarrassing the company or whatever. I don't know what their concerns were, and she didn't want to do it. So we finally got a, a New York agent to serve a federal grand jury subpoena for her appearance, and so she had to come out, and she was not – uh, real open to to our line of questioning at first, but then we explained to her the impact on all these people, and we explained to her how important it was that she that she had no idea that her pictures were going, and we were able to bring her around and finally convince her. And she was a she was an exceptional witness. She she took the stand and she did a really good job. But it just uh, it kind of illustrates sometimes what you have to go through. And that shows another type of victim. These these girls. Of course, we had another gal who was a who was a prostitute, and uh, so there was a whole gambit of of uh, um, economics uh, for the girls that uh, that uh, were portrayed as love angels and uh, was a prostitute. One of the appeals there was, uh, you know, that she had actually been in an automobile accident. And uh, she was a very beautiful woman, and she. They went to the hospital and took pictures of her with her bruises and her black eye, and and uh, and so Donald Lowry made up a story that she had been traveling uh, to go visit Mother Maria in Mexico, and she was in a traffic accident, and she had no money to pay her hospital bills, and uh, would the members send send money? Uh, to help pay for her hospital bills, and they got a, they made a lot of money off that promotion. So they used the victims both ways. They used the the girls as victims. They used the uh, the widowers and the uh, lonely men as as uh, victims. Now, I guess when you look at the women, you needed to have them come in because you were trying to prove a negative. You were trying to prove that the Love angels didn't exist, but then again, you have all these pictures and you have all these letters that are supposed to be from these women. So you needed to have them come in to say, no, you know, I'm not a love angel. That's not my background. I didn't write that letter. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's another good proof. Another another real real thing that uh, hit the jury. Um, you never knew. He, he, Donald... He had a uh, a very good uh, attorney, and uh, he did a really good job of trying to uh, create 
a reasonable uh, doubt on in some of the jurors' mind. We we know we know they they managed to do on the on the one young fellow in the jury, but it was uh, it wasn't the kind of thing where when the case went to the jury, we we're standing around saying it was a slam dunk. It was it was not a slam dunk by any means. And I remember as being my first big trial, I remember standing there. Well, the other thing was, too, uh, when when we got the closing arguments, uh, uh, Tate Chambers and I, I he had me uh, sitting next to him. Uh, I was kind of like his right-hand man during the trial. And we would talk on the way to, on the way to the trial. We'd talk on the way home. And so when it came time for closing arguments, he... He was bouncing all kinds of stuff off me for his for his uh, closing argument, and I was. It made me feel really good uh, when he stood up and gave his closing arguments, and and in my mind I'm going, you know what? I suggested that to him. You know, he he was using stuff that that we had talked about, and all three of them did did a very good job. Uh, Daryl and Canals and and Hillary Fruman and and Tate. Did a, a great job, uh, just just uh, destroying the defense's argument on the thing. And so I'm standing there uh, when finally the, the jury was out for a while. You know, when the jury comes back and asks questions, they come back and ask questions several times. We're all sitting on pins and needles, saying, "Oh, what are, what are they looking at? Why why is this important?" And but when they came back and and uh, uh, the judge asked the foreman, uh, "How do you find on count one guilty, count two guilty, count three guilty, count four right down the line?" You just keep getting. It's it, honestly, it's one of the one of the most. You, you get a real high. You get a real good feeling that you know you've spent the last two years doing an investigation, and and you've got the results that that you expected, and and that that should have happened. And another side light that I, I'll bring up is uh, the the last count, count twenty was money laundering, and up until this point in the FBI, money laundering had only been charged in in uh, in drug cases, and we came down uh, and had a discussion, and and Tate said that's a twenty year count. He goes, we've never done it, so he went and got permission from the U.S. attorney. He said. How about if uh, we charge money laundering? <laughs> and and, uh, and the U.S. attorney said, "Yeah, go for it." So he said, "Jim, go get me one where you can trace the money going from the solicitation to the call, and then show the deposit into the call's checking account or their account." So we did that, and we used that as a as a charge of money laundering. Afterwards, I. Uh, Checked with a section chief in, in the white collar section at FBI headquarters, and he came back and he said, "You know what?" He said, "You're the second case." He said, "There's a California case where they just by six months they charged a money laundering case in a white collar crime case." And he said, "You you are the second one in the United States that charged money laundering and got a conviction uh, in a white collar case." So. I thought, hey, not bad for a first office agent, right? <laughs> not bad at all. So the the Church of Love, and they abbreviated for they abbreviated it by calling it Call International. Church of Love sounds like a better marketing name. Yeah, I don't think they really um, they use Call International. I think they I think they probably wanted to keep it kind of generic. You know, they didn't want to. Uh, track, I know, Church of Love, uh, I think that, that kind of thing, especially when it played out in the, in the papers, that's, that's the kind of thing that I didn't expect. I didn't expect all the, you know, Associated Press to pick it up. I didn't expect, uh, all the major new newspapers to pick it up. I didn't, I didn't expect to get a, a call from the Geraldo show wanting me to come on and, and that Geraldo Rivera was going to do a, a show on the Church of Love, you know. But did you, did you go on? Uh, no, my special agent in charge of Springfield Division. He he thought it was a he did, he he kind of likened it to Jerry Springer, and uh, he he lumped it all into that sensationalism. And he didn't want he didn't want the FBI to be put up 
on that scale. So he he declined. He wrote a letter and declined the offer. But but the postal inspector Tom Kellen he did, and uh, he, he was very uh, generous about spreading the uh, the credit. It, to the FBI and to the and the Moline Police Department, and the IRS, because it was a it was a true joint investigation. It really went went well. We all we all divided up the the work we had to do, and we got it done. You can really have a lot of a lot of good successes when you work uh, work with other agencies. And uh, I always look forward to joint investigations. Well, I know one of the links that I will put in the show notes is an article that appeared in People magazine. So, yeah, definitely this case got a lot of national attention. Well, the other thing that kind of charged it up, too, was the fact that between uh, they they let them go out on their own recognizance uh, with all their ties to the community uh, after they were convicted and between conviction and, and sentencing, and they took off. Donald and Pamela St. Charles, they uh, they fled. They became federal fugitives. And uh, the Marshal Service, uh, they they did a fusion upon and eventually found them and brought them back for sentencing. <laughs> so that that was another thing that was sen- sensationalized and and it attracted the uh, media attention because all of a sudden you have these fugitives, the the old man and his young and his young uh, protege, they're running around leaving uh, Esther at home with with her sons. You know, so. It's, as a new agent, you couldn't have had a better uh, introduction to the criminal justice system. <laughs> it had a little bit of everything. That is pretty interesting. So I guess the last thing that we need to know is what kind of time did they get? I just don't have it in front of me right now, but it was. I think some of them were concurrent. Uh, I know Don Lowry, he served his time and he got out. I think uh, it was a short time after he got out, he, he passed away. And Pamela St. Charles has served her time. I have no idea what she's doing now, but it was lengthy. I was over over ten years in prison for sure. For both I, of them? Yeah, I don't think I don't think running on the marshals helped them out too much either at sentencing. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it did. So I would imagine that when you have victims, even though you you talked about the victims being reluctant to consider themselves victims, and to testify. And I guess two of the reasons would be because if they looked at their dollar amount, it accumulated or totaled to a larger amount, but it sounds like the offerings were about 15 to $30 at a top. Yes, for, for most of them, I think. But they did this over a number of years and several times, you know, a month. I guess the other reason that they were reluctant is the embarrassment. I mean, many of these men thought they were in love, and then to find that there's some guy writing these beautiful romantic love letters to them, I guess that was embarrassing for them? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I can't walk in anybody else's shoes, but it had to have been a revelation. It had to be, you know, it's, uh, you know everything you believed in, and if you find out that it's all, all a scam... You know, it's it's uh, nobody likes you know nobody. For instance, nobody likes the the guy that comes in and says he's going to pave your pave your driveway and then and then paints it and walks away and said it it's repaved. You know, and they, when you realize that you've been scammed, some of them were outraged, some of them were just really embarrassed and didn't want to talk about it. But I think some of that really really helped in the jury appeal because people could see that they when when people were testifying. And Tate would stand up there and say, "Well, isn't it true you gave ten thousand dollars to? How do you make your living? You're you're an auto mechanic. How much do you make a year? And then, well, over these over these four years, you gave ten thousand dollars to your fantasy. Is it isn't that true? Or you get he? Of course, that's leading the witness. But he would say you gave ten thousand dollars to the to the church to call international. And the guy would have to testify truthfully and say yes." You know, and he, you know, some some of them were mousy, some of them uh, were. You could tell they were angry. It, it affected the different people different ways when they found out that it was all just a, just a story that they were buying into. And I guess there's a combination because it was a romantic and a love thing, but it also was a charitable thing because 
they were being told that these were, quote unquote, wayward girls who had been sinners who were trying to become better women and purified so that they could be worthy of the men's love. Right. And I, I even think they, uh, you know, they said they they were going to be re-virginized too, I think. I think that was part of the whole uh, story to, to sell them, that someday you're going to come and visit these young girls. But uh, it was it was kind of... I don't you know, to I'm remember. sorry, I, I had to laugh. Being re-virginized sounds kind of painful <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, yeah, we had we had one guy, he was he was a... He was a riot. He was he was testifying, and he's an older guy. And it just you reminded me of that when you said that. But he, uh, Tate Chambers asking me said, uh, "So you did you intend when once you gave all this and when you went to Shonda's Zaw to meet your love angel? Did you did you intend to have sex with the love angel?" And the guy he looks at the judge. He says, "Well, you honor." In my case, that I didn't expect <laughs> to have sex with her because Father Time is taking care of Mother Nature. So. <laughs> and the whole the whole courtroom just started laughing, even the judge. <laughs> <laughs> so even though you talked about one of the victims being a professor, most of these men were custodians and uh, auto workers or truck drivers. They were just lonely men with minimal incomes that they were willing to use and sacrifice for love exactly it's sad it's sad that anybody would take advantage of them to lie in you know their pockets now i was just he was living a good lifestyle as well he you know the the cash contributions i think uh i don't know if i'm trying to remember if the, i don't think the irs ever did bring any charges because most people probably don't know but the irs it takes a long time for them they have a lot of approvals that they have to have in order to get an IRS conviction. And I'm not sure the approval amount was, but I, I'm sure the cash that contributions he was getting in, sure he wasn't all claiming that all on his tax returns either. So he was spending a lot of money on a lot of things and uh, taking advantage of people who, again, are walking along, the, uh, picking up metal along roads so that they can put together $20 to send to send this, it's pretty bad news for, for these people. This is just one of the cases that you talk about in your new book. So I just wanted to remind everybody again that your new book about your career in the FBI is Fidelity, Bravery, and Integrity, My Story, The True Life and Career of an FBI Special Agent. And they can get that at Amazon.com. Yes, and also on my website at www.jimfurry.com. That one will come direct from me. It's a glossy glossy print instead of a, a paper print at Amazon. All right, well, I will make sure that I also put a link to your website in the episode show notes. So we've talked about this case, and we talked a little bit about you know your time as a first office agent. I'd like to just take a little bit of time to find a little bit more about your story. When did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? I was a, a school teacher and I'd had a, a really bad experience with a student. I Basically, uh, I was disciplining a student whose father happened to be the president of the school board. So I was out of a teaching job real quick. It turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Because uh, at the time, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, but it forced me to go out and look for another job. And uh, I had I had, had an uncle who was a section chief in, in FBI headquarters. He called me and said, I can't, I can't get you an agent's job. He says, you have to work as a clerk for a while. But he says, uh, I'll send you an application and you can, you can apply. So I did. I got hired as a, a clerical employee in the voucher unit. Long story short, it was 11 years. But they came out with a program called uh, Special Surveillance Group, Working Surveillances. So I became part of the first SSG program, and they sent us to New Orleans to uh, do uh, surveillance on Soviet shipping. I was down in New Orleans for a couple years, and then they transferred me back to Washington field office. And I did uh, foreign counterintelligence surveillance on Russians and Eastern European satellites, and then 
and I got letters in 1985 to begin new agents class. I did four years out in Rock Island doing white collar, doing all kinds of BCMO, uh, violent crime, major offenders, fugitives, the kind of stuff that you learn how to how to investigate crimes in a in a small office. And then I got transferred to Newark. About 16 years, I worked organized crime until I became a supervisor. And then I uh, again, instead of an organized crime squad, which I knew, uh, they put me in charge of the crimes against children. Innocent Images Squad, which is undercover agents doing uh, online uh, chats with uh, sexual predators out on the Internet, which was really a gratifying experience for me. And then 9-11 occurred, and I was a, I was a supervisor of the uh, World Trade Center bombing. A lot of the uh, suspects in that lived in New Jersey, and quite frankly, our New York office was... Uh, was kind of under a lot of stress at the time, and so Newark Newark Division was uh, like the command post of the World Trade Center investigation, and uh, then they gave me an opportunity to go back to organized crime, and I finished my career as a uh, organized crime supervisor. So when did you retire, and what are you doing now? Okay, I retired in 2005, and on my retirement day, I got a call from a friend who said, uh, how would you like to do some anti-money laundering consulting. So I thought I'd give it a try, and that try turned into 10 years. So I worked 10 years in doing anti-money laundering consulting work, and then I finally finished the book uh, when I decided to, I, uh, you know, I needed to spend more time with family and take care of the time that I have left to live. So uh, I promised my 94-year-old mother that I would finish the book, and so I finished the book. I always like to give my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? Well, number one, I'd like to say thank you very much, Jerry, for having me on. I think I really appreciate you uh, bringing forth uh, the information about my, about my book, and uh, I hope it's beneficial to your listeners. And number two, uh, I appreciate uh, the life that I've had in the that I had in the FBI, and I sincerely hope that anybody that considers it a career, it's it's one of the Uh, most gratifying careers you can have. And that's the end of the interview. Back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Jim Furry. You'll find a link to his book and several articles about the Church of Love. I hope you enjoyed the interview and share it with your friends, family, and associates. At the bottom of the episode's show notes, you'll find social media share buttons And of course, if you're using a podcast app, you can share it directly from your device. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review so that every Thursday morning, a new episode magically appears on your phone or tablet. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for you this week, but I have an excuse. I've been busy preparing for the publication of my next FBI crime novel, Greedy Givers. As a matter of fact, I'm looking for advanced readers. So if you're interested in getting a free copy of Greedy Givers in exchange for an honest review on Amazon, please email me. In the meantime, Pay to Play, my crime novel about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry is available now at Amazon as an ebook, trade paperback, and audiobook. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.